Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, for our third and final talk uh, today, we're very happy to um, have Emily Cliff from the University of Sherbrooke, and she's going to be telling us about quasi universal sheets and uh, generic modules. Yeah. Or bricks. Okay. Oh, yeah, it should be bricks. Uh, Thank thanks you. for the introduction and for the uh, invitation and organizing the conference. The last two times that I was in Cambridge was for a karate competition. So I came here on a bus and got beat up and then went home. So this is much, much better. <laughs> Enjoying Cambridge a lot more this time. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about these things and probably you don't know what they are and that's fine. Um, so this is based on joint work with Colin Ingalls and uh, Charles Paquette. And it's kind of an interesting project for me because the application is to the representation theory of finite dimensional algebras, which is not my area at all, but it is what Charles works on. And uh, Colin kind of connected us in the middle because he heard Charles give a talk and then he thought, oh, I think we could help him. Um, and so we exchange these emails and Colin will say something and then Charles will write back and say, no, I don't think that's quite right because of some al algebra reason that I don't understand at all. And I'll write back and say, I think it's not quite right because of some algebraic geometry reason that Charles doesn't un understand at all. But in the end, it's the same reason. So it's, it's kind of cool to see these things. Uh, well, we just don't chew on each other's conjectures. You get to prove things right, at all. Right, 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 right. Yeah, sometimes things are, sometimes Colin sends us correct emails. It's true. Um, OK. so. This is the plan to start with um, the motivation, which does come from finite dimensional algebras. Um, and the goal is to study brick infinite algebras, whatever those are. Um, but the tool that we're going to be using is moduli spaces of quiver representations and twisted sheaves on them. So that's a background section. Um, and then there's a construction, which is to build. We'd like to have a universal sheaf, but we don't. So we build a, a quasi universal sheaf. Um, and by we, I don't just mean us, I mean other people, also including Vicky, for example. Um, and then the application then will come back to see how this actually fits into the, the algebra story. Um, so, okay, this is a broad audience and also probably not in the representation theory of finite dimensional algebra. So please feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any time. Okay, so let's start with this. Uh, Algebra story. It's too bad that the well, figure covers the title. Okay, so here's a, a thing that algebra people like to do, which is to study um, finite dimensional algebras over K and to see how many infinite, how many classes of finite dimensional indecomposables you have up to isomorphism. And so an algebra is of infinite type if there are infinitely many, and it's a finite type otherwise. Um, and this problem has been studied for a long time. And so there are some results. And one of them is that a single module, N is called a generic module, if it satisfies these three conditions. So it should be indecomposable, but it should be infinite dimensional. Um, but on the other hand, its length, um, so they call this its endo length, but it's a module over its own endomorphism ring, and its length, so the length of a filtration of the kind that Asalata was talking about, um, should be finite. So it's infinite as a vector space, but it still has some controlled condition. And the theorem of Crowley Bovey is that uh, if you can find one generic module, then you're of infinite type. And if and conversely as well. So this is a criteria. Um, and it, it's of geometric origin, because these generic modules are going to be coming from moduli spaces. OK, now a brick is a little bit different. So an N, N an A module, is a brick if its endomorphism algebra is a division algebra. Um, and then we can say that A is brick infinite if it admits infinitely many isomorphism classes of finite dimensional bricks. So a brick is in particular indecomposable because if you could decompose it, then you can kind of think of some, some matrix of endomorphisms and we know that, that um, a matrix ring is not a division algebra. But maybe 
So, so I guess what representation theorists might be interested in is algebras that are of infinite representation type. So they're kind of harder, but they're still brick finite. And that would give them some control over this previously bad, hard class of algebra. So they're interested in, in a criteria for knowing when uh, an algebra is brick infinite. Um, another application for this, apparently, is that uh, it's exciting if you like cluster algebras. So a brick infinite algebra is something called tau type tilting infinite. And this lets you construct examples of cluster algebras or something. I'm not an expert on that. Either. OK. So we'd like to have an analog of this kind of theorem, I guess, which is that we should have some kind of generic brick that tells us when A is of infinite representation type. So, uh, so here's the definition what a generic brick should be. It should be a generic module. So it has these three conditions. But in addition, um, its endomorphism ring should be a division algebra. And the conjecture made by Kaveh Musavan and, and Shaw, my collaborator, is the following, that an algebra is brick infinite uh, if and only if it admits a generic brick. So the first and third conditions are completely analogous to these. But there's a middle condition, um, which is that the, the way they phrase it, they, they call it brick continuous, if you look in their papers. But what it means is that there's an infinite one parameter family of bricks. And in particular, um, well, you could imagine having infinitely many bricks, but of all of different dimensions, right? But if you have one family, they're all going to be of, of the same dimension. Uh, oh, there's like a moduli space. That exactly. So, so this is basically saying that the moduli space of representations of some dimension vector uh, is of dimension at least one. So that's the, that's the geometric interpretation of this fact. Um, and they can prove this for hereditary algebras. Apparently, it's not hard, but I don't, don't know anything about that. Um, but in general, they say this is very hard to prove or even to, even to look for counterexamples to study because they just don't know how to produce generic bricks. So this was, um, I guess, Charles gave some talk, and he mentioned this conjecture. And then he, he said, we have this problem. And he said, if we had a universal sheaf on the moduli space, we could solve this problem, I think. Is, he said he thought. Um, and Colin was in the audience. And, and, and Charles then said, but we know that we can't find a universal sheaf. And, uh, but Colin said, well, we can probably find some kind of twisted universal sheaf. And maybe that does the trick. So that's how this project started. And so our goal is going to be kind of proving one direction that, that if we have this infinite family, so if we have a <coughs> moduli space, of positive dimension, then we construct a generic brick. So that's the goal, and, and, and that's kind of all I'm going to say about finite dimensional algebras, and now it, it will be more geometry. Yes? Can anyone explain this? I mean, it would be generic. Right, I mean, this was just their definition, right? They, this is it, but we. It seems like, and I don't know if the people who came up with these words originally, this is not the way Charles thinks about it, but that it's related to a generic point of the moduli space. So it's probably not a coincidence, but, um, but they use it in this very algebraic way. Any other questions? OK. So let me fix some notation about moduli spaces of quiver representations. And just I've, I've set up there at the top that our goal throughout is going to be to use this moduli space, I'm going to call it M, to construct generic bricks. So okay, recall or learn really quickly, um, every finite dimensional algebra is Morita equivalent to a quotient of a, a quiver algebra for Q, a finite connected quiver, and I, something called an admissible ideal. These details are not too important, but what it says is that um, if we can produce these generic bricks for the quiver case, then that's good enough. They'll be happy. So we're just going to ignore any other kind of algebra. Um, and actually, for us in this talk, I'm not going to worry about the ideal. It's just going to be 
uh, a, a quiver. So unlike uh, Martina, my quivers are acyclic, and that's necessary for finite dimensionality. But I'm going to denote my quiver by Q. Q0 are the vertices. Q1 are the arrows. Here's a little example with two vertices and three arrows. And A is the algebra generated by these arrows. And I'm going to use D to denote a dimension vector. So it's a list of dimensions. Um, and then, as we saw in Martina's talk, what should we do? I should put a vector space of dimension di at vertex di, and I should put a matrix of the appropriate size to get a linear map anytime I have an arrow. So that's the, the picture. Um, but if we want formulas, then I'm going to consider R the set of all representations. So that's just lists of matrices of the correct size. And it's acted upon by a group, which is changing the coordinates. So my group, I'll denote it by G, but it's a product of, of gener general linear groups. And I'm just changing, changing coordinates in each vector space. Um, and something that's important to notice is that we have a copy of, of GM, which I denote by delta for diagonal. So all the diagonal matrices, if I conjugate, it cancels out. And so that acts trivially. So this action of G factors through a quotient, which we'll call K. So that's just um, notation to establish. And then we build a moduli space. And I'm going to uh, skip a lot of details, but there's some kind of stability condition. Um, and we choose RS, the stable representations. The thing that, that is important for us to know is that a stable <coughs> representation, um, so if I, if I choose V to be a stable representation and I look at the things in G that fix it, it's exactly delta, this group delta, which means that the quotient group P acts freely. And so, okay. um, and so I can look at a quotient of RS by P, and that's going to be a principal P bundle of pi. This is our coarse moduli space. Or I can look at a stacky quotient by G, if you like that kind of thing. If you don't, you can ignore that. Um, I'll denote that by curly M, and that's a gerb. Um, and so probably I should be denoting this by MS to remind us that it's stable. But for the whole talk, we will only consider stable representations. So I'm not going to bother. And then um, a remark. Our first connection to the algebra business is that if V is stable, its endomorphisms are just K, and so V is a brick. And so if the dimension of M is at least one, then K is brick infinite. But it's possible to imagine that, that KQ would be brick infinite, but the dimension of M could still be zero. Maybe it has infinitely many discrete points, or maybe if we look at infinitely many different Ds, we're getting finitely many representations in each of them. So this is not an <coughs> if and only if statement that I'm making here, but we have this one direction. And this is, the, this is brick continuous. Are there any questions about that so far? OK, so now I can erase this box that got moved anyway. So OK, Charles said, I wish I had a universal bundle. We don't, but let's imagine for a second that we did. What would it be? It would be a sheaf on M, which has an action of, of the algebra. So it's a sheaf of K, Q, tensor O, M modules, such that if I take any point, any representation, and I take the fiber of my sheaf at the image, so the, the class of equivalences of that representation, I recover V as a K, Q module. That would be a universal sheaf if it existed. And we know by work of King that it exists if the GCD of our dimension vectors is 1. And we know that it doesn't exist more generally. So in general, we'll find what I'll call a quasi-universal bundle. There's also a paper of, of Vicky Hoskins and Schaffhauser where they construct something called universal twisted representations, which I think is not exactly the same thing as what we do. But they're using all the same ingredients. So it's very similar. Um, 
So I will explain what a quasi-universal bundle is eventually and how we get one. So first, I need this machinery of, of twisted sheets. Um, and before I do that, I'm going to establish some notation and conventions about ordinary sheaves. So I'm going to start at the top there. I have u from y to m, which is an etat cover of varieties. And then I have this diagram over here that just shows my notation. So if I have the fiber product of two copies of y, I have two push forwards, which I'm going to call p1 and p2. And from, from three copies of y, I'm going to call those, those projection maps q. And the indices tell you where we go. Hopefully that's not too confusing. And so if I have a sheaf on M, let's call it F0, so a sheaf downstairs, I get this data upstairs, so descent data. Um, so this is probably familiar, but I want to review it because we're going to modify it in a minute. So I can pull back my sheaf from M to Y, and I'll call that F. And then I know that if I pull back further to two copies of Y, Along P1 and P2, what I get is isomorphic. So I have some isomorphism phi, which satisfies this co-cycle condition on the threefold product. Here it is in a diagram, and here it is in the formula. And this pair is called descent data. And the important fact is that there's an equivalence between descent data and sheaves downstairs. I said that's why it's called descent. It descends. That's right. Yeah. Um, yes. OK. But now what we would like to do is look at this condition and say, OK, what if this composition here was not exactly equal to this composition here, but equal up to multiplication by a scalar? And so this is the notion of a, a twisted sheaf, which is described in the PhD thesis of Andre Calderaro. And so he says, let's start with our, our scalar. So it's going to be a two co-cycle, satisfy some condition, but it's a map alpha from the threefold product into GM. And an alpha twisted sheaf on M is defined by a pair, F and phi, where as before, F is a sheaf upstairs on Y. Phi is an isomorphism, but the co-cycle condition is now twisted by alpha. This is a, a reasonable definition to make. And when alpha is equal to 1, we just recover ordinary sheaves. So, um, so this theorem says that one twisted sheaves are just sheaves on M. But now we have this whole other collection of families of sheaves that we could study. Um, and so that is what we will do. And uh, just here are a few properties that are going to be important. So we can tensor sheaves together. And we can also tensor twisted sheaves together. And what's going to happen is that the twists are going to add or multiply, depending on whether GM is a multiplicative or additive. So if I have F, which is alpha twisted, and G, which is beta twisted, then F tensor G is alpha beta twisted. And as a, in a particular example, if E is locally free and I take its dual, then it will be alpha minus 1 twisted. And so if I tensor E with its dual, it's always 1 twisted which means it's just a sheaf, or it descends to a sheaf. Sometimes I'll be sloppy about whether I'm upstairs or downstairs. So from twisted sheaves, we can produce real sheaves, but they aren't a priori real sheaves. Are there any questions? Yeah. Are you restricting that sheaves of like modules to bring in yeah. spaces? Modules. modules. Yeah, OM modules. Two twisted rank one sheaves for the group. Our group is there an analog? Um, yeah, and I think it, but I think it's like somehow like a graded group, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here um, are some interpretations of twisted sheaves. These things were maybe studied before Calderaro came up with this formulation, and then he explains how they are all really the same thing after all. So let's start with this data of a cover, u from y to m, 
and E phi is a twisted sheaf twisted by some alpha, and I'm going to assume it's locally free. And so we're going to see that we can build a projective bundle, because if we remember what's the condition for E to be alpha twisted, it's just that we have this equation here. The, the co-cycle condition holds, except we have to multiply by alpha. <coughs> but now if I projectivize, my scalar goes away. Right? So um, I can look at the induced map on the projective bundles, and it satisfies the same equation, but now those things are equivalent. And so the projective bundle descends from y to m. Um, here's some homological arguments for those who like that. So the projective bundle gives me a class in H1 with coefficients in PGLN, and the co-boundary map produces for me an alpha in H2, and that's the same alpha. And we know that there would be a lift here if and only if this was in the kernel. And so there's a lift when alpha is equal to 1, and a lift is exactly saying that the original sheaf descended. And so I could do this because E was locally free and it made sense to projectivize. Um, but then once I've chosen one E and I built this PE and I descended it, there are certain sheaves on, on this space, PE bar, um, which has some nice properties along the fibers, and these are equivalent to alpha twisted sheaves on M. So that's one description. If you don't want to deal with the twist, you can kind of hide your twist in this space PE and then deal with ordinary sheaves. Um, another approach is via Azumaya algebras. So as we said, E tensor E dual uh, is one twisted, so it descends. But E twist, tensor E dual is also the endomorphism algebra of E, so it's an algebra. It has multiplication given by composition. And this is what's called an Azumaya algebra. And it turns out that alpha twisted sheaves are in bijection with sheaves of A modules on M. So that's another way to not talk about twisted sheaves, is instead to hide the data of alpha inside of A and then talk about A modules. Um, and finally, for those who like gerbs, a co-cycle determines a gerb, whatever that is, over M. And because the co-cycle was defined over Y, my gerb is trivial over Y, meaning that if I pull back, I get a space that looks like y across the classifying stack. And that means that if I have a sheaf on m alpha, it pulls back to a sheaf on y equipped with a BGM, with a GM action. And then I can say that um, alpha twisted sheaves on m, the not curly m, alpha twisted sheaves downstairs are the same as sheaves on m alpha which descend. So these are sheaves on M alpha, which have weight one uh, with the, under the GM action. That's another way to talk about these things. Um, it's not super important for following the whole talk, but we'll see that um, these interpretations can, can come in in different ways to help us understand the construction that we're doing. Is there a way to phrase this more generally for um, situations where you have a good mobilized phase of the stack, where you have some object on the stack that uh, yeah, um, I don't know if I, maybe we can discuss later if you have a particular case in mind. This is, this is general enough to cover the case that I'm interested in, so. Okay, so <clears throat> let's construct a twisted sheaf on this moduli space. M, which I recall is the quotient of Rs by P. And here, I'm basically following an argument of Mukai, um, who did this for vector bundles, the moduli space of vector bundles on a curve. Um, he didn't use the language of twisted sheaves, so then Calderaro basically repeats the proof in the language of twisted sheaves. And we're doing the same thing. The difference here is that we have an algebra. So that makes our life more complicated. We're not just vector bundles, it's representations. But on the other hand, they have a base curve, and we just have a point. So, um, so some things become easier, and some things become harder. But we start with two key observations. The first is that 
Rs, just the set of representations, that admits a universal bundle. No problem. Um, and how, how would I define that? We want the details. It's just a direct sum of copies of the structure sheaf. So I stick the right number of copies of the structure sheaf at each vertex, and then I have a, a tautological multiplication graph. Now, what I would like is for this to descend, and it's not going to work. But let's see why it doesn't work and what we can do instead. So, so we have a principal P bundle, um, and a bundle, a sheaf upstairs will descend to a sheaf downstairs if and only if it's P equivariant. But it's not P equivariant, it's G equivariant. And that the action of, well, the difference between G and P was this copy of GM, this diagonal delta, and it acts by weight minus one and not by weight zero. So that's the failure of descent here. Um, so we have to try to fix this a little bit. And so what we do is let's choose a cover of M, I'm going to call it Y, over which the principal bundle trivializes. So I want that when I pull back RS, I get Y cross P. And so the existence of it, the fact that it's trivial means that I have a section. Uh, and so that's what sigma is doing there, sigma is being a, a section that tells us that the bundle has trivialized over Y. And on Y cross P, I have two sheaves. So I could take my universal sheaf, which was on RS, and I could pull it back by V. It has weight minus one, same as it did before. But I also have a line bundle because I have Y cross G living over Y cross P, and that's a, the fibers are GM. So I have a line bundle from that, and that's of weight one. And so I tensor them together, and now I have something of weight zero. And so that descends, so I'm happy. Okay. So now I have a universal bundle, but it's not on M, it's on Y, which was just some random cover that I chose at some stage. And I would like that to descend, and this is the thing that I'm not going to be able to fix. But I can do something. So it's a universal bundle, and that means that if I pull it back along these two ways, it's going to be isomorphic, because it's still going to be universal. And now I look at this co-cycle. So I, I've rearranged my co-cycle condition by putting this term over here. So now this should be one, if it was going to be a co-cycle. It's not one, but it is an automorphism of a family of stable bundles. And that means that it's multiplication by something in here. So that means it's multiplication by alpha, which means that this is an alpha twisted sheaf. So. OK, so I don't quite have a sheaf on M, but I have an alpha twisted sheaf on M, which is given by an actual sheaf over this cover and an isomorphism that almost glues but doesn't quite glue. Other questions about that? Yeah. Um, does this uh, alpha twisted sheaf depend on the choice of kappa Y? Um, not up to isomorphism. So if I chose a different cover Y, then I would have a common refinement. Okay. up to maybe tensoring by a line bundle or some of these things that you have with universal sheets. But these choices make Yeah, okay. yeah. OK, so I have an alpha twisted sheaf. And now we can use these various methods that, that we talked about before to produce a real sheaf on M, so that I lose this information of a choice of a cover. That was too much. I don't want to carry that around. Um, and so well, we use this trick, which is that if I can find any alpha inverse twisted sheaf of rank n, and then I tensor it up with ue, now it's one twisted, and it will descend. But it won't be universal anymore, because I've tensored with some vector bundle. So if, say, e was rank n, now the fiber of uy tensor e is isomorphic to v tensor k to the n. So I'm getting n copies of what I wanted. And that's exactly the definition of a quasi-universal bundle. It's a bundle such that at each fiber, instead of getting exactly the, the tautological thing, you get some copies of it. Well, copies are a bit annoying, but it's not so bad if you have a way of identifying, pulling out your copies. But our goal is to minimize n. Just, you know, why have all these extra copies if we don't need them? 
Um, so here are some numbers that, that are occurring uh, and, and will be important as we try to minimize n. So remember that d was our dimension vector. I'm going to use little d to denote the GCD of the entry. So if that was 1, then we're in King's setting and everything's fine. We're going to assume that it's not 1. Um, capital D is going to be the sum of the di's. And that's the rank of, of ui, or the, the, dimen the total dimension of a, of a representation in this part of the moduli space. And I'm just going to denote by di0 the minimum of my di. So the naive candidate, we're looking for E, which is alpha inverse twisted of rank N. Well, we have UE, which is, was free of rank capital D. So we can just take its dual. And that will always work. So we can definitely do this uh, and get our N to be capital D, which could be really big. So let's try to do better. Um, a remark is that if I ignore the KQ module structure and just think about the OM module structure, each of the individual summands, which was free of rank DI, is alpha twisted. So I can choose the smallest one. And so here I get N to be DI zero, the minimum. So that's a bit better. Um, but I, I don't know, I believe, Colin doesn't always believe, but I think that we should be able to find E of rank N, which is the GCD. This is an open question, except in a few cases. So here are some partial results. We can always choose alpha to have values in mu d, the d roots of unity. Um, and so when d is equal to 1, alpha has values in mu 1. So alpha is equal to 1. And so it wasn't twisted. So it descends already. And OK, so we recover the result of king. Um, another fact is that if we were working over a curve, so if I restrict to a smooth curve in M, and I have alpha, which is mu d twisted, I can always find a rank d vector bundle. So over an any irreducible smooth curve, this works. And so from the point of view of the result that, that the representation theorists are trying to prove, this is enough because they're interested in brick continuity. They're interested in curves inside of the moduli space. And so over any curve, uh, we can find a minimal rank quasi-universal bundle. And so for the, for the point of view of that theorem, we don't actually need to answer this question and do any better, but I still think it would be very satisfying if, if we could. So if anyone has any ideas, uh, please let me know. Are there any questions about this? Here's another construction um, that yields the same thing from a totally different perspective. So before, we were kind of copying Mukai and Calderaro, who were working with moduli spaces of vector bundles, and who knew kind of about twisted sheaves and quasi-universal sheaves. And here, we're following Engel and Reinecke, who were really working with moduli spaces of quivers and weren't, didn't even know, maybe, that twisted sheaves existed. So the input to their construction, they start with a the same data that we have so far, Q and D and some stability condition. And then they add some extra data, which we'll, we'll, we're going to vary. So they choose an additional vector, EI. They throw in an extra vertex, which they call infinity. And then for each vertex I, they throw in EI arrows. So they build a new quiver. Um, great, that's our new quiver. And then, well, now they get a moduli space for that quiver, um, which is what I've drawn here. And they, they have a clever way of choosing a stability condition so that things behave nicely. And then they take the moduli space associated to this new quiver Q hat. Um, and so the result is a moduli space M hat E, because it depends on E, living over M. And the fibers are projective uh, projective spaces of dimension E times D minus 1. Okay. For us, we're interested in two specific versions of E. One is where E is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So we throw in one extra vertex and one arrow pointing everywhere. Or we choose a favorite vertex, throw in infinity, and we have one arrow pointing to infinity. 
Those are our two examples, and they yield two kinds of projective bundles. Uh, so one of them has fibers of dimension bj minus 1, and one of them has fibers of dimension capital B minus 1. And the uh, result that we haven't quite worked out all the details, but we definitely believe that it's true, is that this moduli, this, this projective bundle over here is the projective bundle associated <coughs> with the chief UY. And that I also said that each of the factors were twisted sheaves, and those are all the projective bundles associated to these guys. So it's the same construction, um, just in this, whether you like to talk about twisted sheaves or you like to talk about projective bundles. We have two, two constructions. Um, and then our, our third perspective on twisted sheaves was gerbs. So remember, we have this boundary map that takes a, a, a class with coefficients in PGLN and produces a co-cycle, uh, a GM co-cycle. So a corollary of this result would be that the image of each of these projective bundles is alpha, which is the twist of UY. And I believe it should be true, but haven't checked outside of a few examples, that the original gerb given by the, the fine moduli stack over the moduli space is the same gerb that we get. It's the same twist. So we're seeing this alpha everywhere. So let's do an example, because uh, that was a bit abstract, perhaps. So here's our quiver. This is what's called a generalized Kronecker quiver, when we have two vertices and a bunch of arrows in the same direction. I'm going to choose the dimension vector 2, 2. And so I'm looking at triples of 2 by 2 matrices. And I have dimension, my representations have dimension 4. And we're going to build a quasi-universal bundle, and it's going to have rank 8. So it's going to be of rank 4 times 2. Unfortunately, this doesn't help us with our question about the minimal thing before, because the 2 is, is the GCD of 2 and 2, but it's also the minimum of 2 and 2. So it's not helping to clarify uh, which is the best we can do. But at least we have a concrete example. And one reason that this example is easy to study is that we have a nice description of the moduli space in terms of quadratic forms. So associated to my three matrices A, B, C, I build a quadratic form in three variables, which sends x, y, z to the determinant of x times A plus y times B plus z times C. So a quadratic form in three variables corresponds to a symmetric three by three matrix, which I'm going to call x. And it's a fact that the triple A, B, C is stable if and only if the determinant of x is non-zero. Um, and so I have a description of M as the set of all matrices, symmetric three by three matrices with non-zero determinant up to scalars. And so this lives in P5, right? Because my three by three symmetric matrix, it has six terms, but I'm allowed to scale them. So I have something in P5 and I throw away this zero locus. So that's our description of M in this case. And I'm going to build a sheaf, which is going to be our U, so a uh, sheaf of Clifford algebras on M. So it has generators E1, E2, E3 with this relation, Eij plus Eji is equal to 2 times Xij. And so that's why it's a sheaf, because Xij is a coordinate on M. So as we move around in the space, our relation is changing. Um, and it's graded if I put Eij in, in degree 1. And this is rank 8, um, where here are some even generators and here are some odd generators. And how do I make this rank 8 vector bundle into a KQ module? Well, I put the even part over here and the odd part over there, and I have three arrows given by multiply by E1, E2, E3. And I claim that this is quasi-universal. So I claim that if I fix a point x, or I fix representatives a, b, c, the three matrices, then the fiber of this sheet a at x is two copies of this guy. So how do we see that? So here I've got my generators 
all that's exactly the same. Um, okay, for simplicity, for the calculation, let's assume we're looking at a point which is diagonal. Otherwise, we can use Gram-Schmidt. Um, so the first observation to make, perhaps, is that the element E1, E2, E3 is central. And if I square it, I'm missing some parentheses here. It's not very. Uh, the square is a scalar, so minus the determinant of this matrix. So what I do here, because I've, I've fixed one x, I can choose a square root of minus the determinant. And then I look <laughs> at the following element. OK, here it is. It has some formula, and it turns out to be even and idempotent. So f squared is equal to f. And that means that I can split the fiber of a at x into two pieces, ax times f and ax times 1 minus f, and they're each of dimension 4, and, they're, and then you just, you, know, you just do linear algebra. You write down a basis, you write down multiplication by e1, e2, e3, you recover a, b, c. Okay. So that's nice and it works. Um, that was just like a direct construction of a, but the construction that I outlined involved building a, a twisted sheaf and pulling back, and so how, how is that? comparing to what we just did. So remember that to choose this splitting, I could do that over every fiber. But the, thing, the reason that we can only get quasi-universal and not universal is because I can't split it globally. I can only split it fiber by fiber. And why? Because I needed to choose delta, a square root of this determinant. So the global picture is that I adjoin formally a square root of the determinant. And so I get a twofold cover. And I can check that when I pull back r along that cover, it trivializes. So once I have delta, I can choose a representative ABC of any class. That gives us the sigma. And the, the claim is that um, the pullback of A along this U is the sheaf that we would get by following Mukai's construction tensored with a, a rank two bundle. So that's what we do in this case. Um, and so this is like kind of the first example where you can really see that we definitely can't do better than quasi-universal. We need, we need these two copies. Any questions? So finally, let's come back to, to the algebra, because it turns out, so at, at this stage, uh, Colin and I thought we were done. Like we, we did it. We've got the quasi-universal thing, and that's what Shaw wanted, so Shaw will be happy. But it turns out that we had a miscommunication between the geometry and algebra. So let's remember where we started in algebra. We're interested in building a generic brick, so we want a KQ module whose endomorphisms are a division algebra, of infinite dimension but finite length over D. And the conjecture was that KQ would be brick infinite if and only if it was brick continuous, if and only if we had a generic brick. It turns out we don't have a generic brick yet. What we have is what Colin started calling a weak generic brick. Now, actually what's weak about it is not the generic part. It's the brick part. So maybe it should be like a generic yoga block or something like this. Um, but OK, what is it? The definition looks a little bit complicated. But um, it's a, it's a, we take a field extension, big K over little k, and we want a module, which is a KQ module, but also a module for this big field. So we extend our algebra <coughs> such that the endomorphisms over this bigger algebra is a division algebra. These same properties hold. Um, right, one and three are the same. Let's not worry about two. And four just says it's not stupid. Okay, we didn't just take an ordinary thing and pull it back along our scales. So really the big difference, which we're going to talk more about, is whether we're talking about endomorphisms over KQ or endomorphisms over something bigger. So the theorem that we have so far 
is that if m is a positive dimension and u is a quasi-universal sheaf, and we take a generic point of some reduced component of dimension, positive dimension, again, we're interested in these, at least a one parameter family, then if we take the um, stock at eta, it yields a weak generic brick where our big field kappa is, or our big field k is kappa of eta, function field at eta. And so how does the, the construction go? Um, well, the key observation is that because of the stability condition and the fact that, that u eta is universal over our moduli space, the endomorphisms of u eta as a, a sheaf of kq modules near eta will be a central simple module. Um, and then, so that means it's isomorphic to matrix ring over some division algebra. And then we just pull out a copy of our division algebra. So even if, even if we didn't minimize, it turns out, <coughs> I have that whole slide on finding the minimal D, even if we hadn't found the minimal D, we could fix it at this stage, but it's just a bit less fun. So. Okay, so what we need to do then is compare these weak versus strong. And so what I really need to do is I'm, I'm looking at endomorphisms of, of some sheaf as a sheaf of KQ modules versus just endomorphisms of its global sections as a KQ module. And, um, right, this is where we had like a breakdown in communication because we would talk to each other or write to each other and just say endomorphisms. And we weren't saying endomorphisms over what. So Colin and I found endomorphisms were D, Charles wanted that, and then only at some stage when we were finally together in the same place did we realize that it's not the same thing, um, a priori. But we still think it in fact is. So our conjecture <coughs> is that the weak generic bricks that we build in our theorem are actually strong. Um, and a reformulation, what we actually need to check is that the inclusion of these maps which are linear both over the field, kappa, eta, and for kq, okay, those are all in particular linear over kq, so we have an inclusion. There's no reason why that should be an equality, but in all of the examples that we check, and in some cases that we could prove, some families, it's always an identity, so it's surjective. So let me show you a non-example. So here I just wrote down a sheaf. It didn't come from u eta, um, but just to get the kind of flavor, so here I'm working in some kind of one-dimensional situation where my, my kappa eta is kx, and I have two arrows, and let's say that they're both one. So let's look at the difference between these endomorphism rings. So if I just want an endomorphism of this thing, which is kq linear, that means I need to give a pair of maps, phi and psi, a priori two kq linear maps, but I want the diagram to commute which tells me that um, phi should be equal to psi, right? Because if I go around this way, I do phi, and then I do one, or I go around this way, I do one, and then I do psi. So phi should be equal to psi, but that's the only condition I have. And so end of kqv is end of kx. This is an infinite dimensional vector space. So these are infinite size, infinite matrices. This is not a division algebra. Um, whereas if I tried to calculate maps that were <coughs> linear over kq and kx, <coughs> then I would just, I would get something much, much smaller. So in general, there's no reason why this inclusion be, should be surjective, but here is an example of something which is coming from a universal sheaf. So let's, again, suppose that we have two <coughs> copies of kx, we have two arrows, one of them is the identity, but one of them is x, multiplied by x. So again, let's try to write down um, these endomorphisms. So okay, again, I need phi and I need psi. I have the same condition from the one arrow that phi is equal to psi. But I also have a condition that if I take any element f, let's say I apply phi and I multiply by x, it's the same as multiplying by x and then applying psi 
but multiplying by x and then applying psi is the same as multiplying by x and applying phi. So suddenly, phi became x linear. And so the endomorphisms of KQV are actually, they're all automatically linear over KX. And so we just get the field back again. We get a division algebra. So it works in this case. It works in all cases that we write down by hand. Occasionally it doesn't work, and then we realize that we made a mistake in calculating the example. Like, so, um, and we can, yeah, we can prove the conjecture uh, in a few cases. So one is the case where, where D is, all the entries of D are one. This is called the thin sincere case. Another case is where we have two vertices and a bunch of arrows. And this is called the generalized Kronecker case. And somehow the intuition is that, like if we, if we look at this example here where it worked, the fact that our representation was universal means that the coordinates of the moduli space all appear in the arrows. And somehow commuting with the arrows should mean that you commute with everything in, the, in your function, your ring of functions. Um, so that's how it seems to work in general. When we work in this case, we can make that argument really rigorous. Um, there's something called a, a generic matrix ring. And this is studied by Prochesi and then by Fromanek. And their results, we can just fit everything into their scenario and, and um, we get the result in general. But, um, and other than that, a few random examples. Now, Martina mentioned, I think, in her talk, some results of Reinecke where if you work hard enough, you can transform any moduli space into a moduli space of quiver representations over a generalized Kronecker thing. So we could do that and then try to apply these generic matrix swings. But what is kind of weird is that our universal sheaf was not just a sheaf over that moduli space. It was a sheaf of KQ modules over a moduli space. So if we change our moduli space, we get a sheaf over a different moduli space, but we don't want to change the algebra. And so we, we haven't been able to, to make that work yet, but yeah, we're, we're working on that part. Um, and then future work. Well, as I said originally, we should be able to deal with not just KQ, but KQ mod I. That doesn't seem too hard. Um, and then we should also kind of be able to combine the ideas that we have here with the ideas of Mukai and Calderon about moduli spaces of vector bundles. So we should be able to have algebras over a curve instead of just algebras. And so that's another area to go. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can assume that this speed is like one. Pardon me? You can assume that this this kappa y is at the same as one. Um. Yeah, like a, a priori, if it worked over a bigger thing, it should still work when you restrict. But we can make it work with examples with more more dimensions. At some stage, we thought we needed to restrict to the curve to get around this minimality, but yeah. Yeah. Could you go back to the generalized Kronecker example first? The one with three arrows? Mm -hmm. um, in the lower left corner of the screen, I, I'm, the, the fact, like, why is this true? Is it, is it like completely straightforward or is there something? I don't uh, understand why that makes Yeah, um, I can show you the paper after. I don't. I don't think it's too too bad. I mean, I didn't tell you anything about stability conditions, but <laughs> modulo. We're here. Yeah, these, this example is pretty explicit, so it's not so. Bad. Other questions? 